Some people consider house training to be such an onerous task that they'd never even consider adopting a puppy, only an adult dog, or maybe no dog at all because they don't want to deal with the mess. Not to worry. We'll teach with a method tonight that is specific to dogs that your puppy or adult dog will understand innately because the principles are already programmed into their brain. Their brain. This brain. Is this, has anything like this happened at your house where you just can't seem to get the job done? We'll cover that and if you have a specific question by all means send me a message during this Facebook Live and we'll we'll stop what I'm talking about and address it. In fact if you have any questions about your pets you're welcome to interject them and I'll address them all tonight. And in case we haven't met, I'm veterinarian Dr. Jeff Nickel. I'm residency trained in veterinary behavior medicine with many years of experience in general practice. This is Miss America, the family border collie, and we have Tony who is kind of snuck off to the side here and guest on the white fuzzy cat who's on the floor. This isn't about cats, but of course they're always invited because we're inclusive with our pets. If they get to be here, maybe they'll learn something. So. Uh, anybody who's uh, tuning in, please hit the heart button if you find this helpful. And please tag your friends if anybody you know uh, is facing a challenge like this. Also, uh, if you can hear me loud and clear, it would be helpful if you hit the wow button just so that I know. And if you uh, tell me where you're from if you're tuning in, I'd love to know. So, let me get started with this thing. The very best way to doing this is a method called the one day house training method. And if you have a new puppy that's six, eight, ten weeks old, the one day method actually works in about one day in most cases. And so what we're going to do is make this very simple and straightforward for new puppies. And if you have an adult dog, um, there can be a variety of reasons why they're house soiling. We don't assume that it's behavioral. We check out other physical systems other than, other than the brain, this brain right here, um, like bladder disease, kidney disease, uh, oh, Cindy, good to see you. Thank you for coming. Um, diabetes can certainly cause a dog or a cat to drink excessively and to pass larger volumes of urine than normal, and they house soil because they can't get outside often enough. Well, that's not a house training problem. Or a pet who's maybe getting elderly and their joints aren't so good and they have trouble getting in and out of a dog door. Or a cat who has trouble jumping up onto a shelf to climb into a, into a litter pan and and people don't realize it. Many dogs who are female dogs were spayed. Um, because of the diminished estrogen in their system, the muscle at the neck of the bladder, what's called the sphincter, loses just enough of its tone so that when they're sleeping, they just lose a little bit of control and they leak while they're sleeping. That's not house training. Those dogs are, well, you find urine in the, in the female dog's bed. An occasional male dog will have a similar problem if he's been neutered. It's almost exclusively female dogs. In fact, about 20% of them who've been spayed have that problem. And it's quite treatable, by the way. There's some very safe medications that you can give daily that work out very well. Um, but we're going to talk about house training, specifically with new puppies, just in case anybody has a new puppy in their home after Christmas. Um, but again, we'll talk also about how you can apply this to adult dogs. So you've got a puppy, and you want to start this method immediately when you get that puppy. And the first thing you do, you pick a day, ASAP, that's going to be house training day, and you set aside a room in your house, like a small guest bathroom, for example, with a tile floor, and you pick up the, uh, the mat and a little fuzzy thing on the toilet seat, and you know, just in case the puppy decides that chewing on towels and stuff like that is going to be a good way to expend his energy or her energy, same thing whether it's a boy or a girl puppy. And the first thing you do that morning, of course, is you put a leash on that puppy and you take him or her outside to your yard, wherever it is that you really prefer that those things occur, um, elimination, and you just stand there and don't say anything at all. And if the puppy produces either physical function, you can tell the puppy that he or she is good, you can give a snack if you like, but don't waste any time at all with partying and hopping around and explaining to, you know, shouting from the rooftop that your puppy did the right thing. Because what the puppy really in the canine, in the canine, in the canine brain 
what they naturally earn if they live free in a, uh, in a feral uh, canine social group that's largely responsible for feeding itself and protecting its resources and all that stuff. The leader provides the great, uh, the great reward, the great reinforcer for that particular good deed by giving the subordinate, whether it's a puppy or an adult dog, lower status than the leader, by allowing that, that subordinate dog the great privilege and the essential need, the social need, to get off the territory and to sniff and investigate and uh, not be accountable to a higher authority off territory and to uh, maybe encounter another dog and do a little bit of rear end sniffing, a highly important social behavior of dogs, um, and to read the bulletin boards and post messages. And they really need to do that, all dogs of all ages, at least a couple of times a day, and it's a privilege that they've earned. But your puppy has that, has that innately programmed into her brain, and so what you're going to do is right from the beginning is you're going to make it easy for the puppy by providing a system that he understands. So you get up in the morning, put a leash on that puppy, go out to the yard, and if you get any stool or urine, uh, you can say good puppy but, and, and give a treat. But the immediate reinforcer is to lead that puppy off territory, that is, out onto the street or the sidewalk where other people have walked their dogs and have left their scent. And it's a social experience for dogs whether they encounter another dog or not because they not only pick up the scent of these other dogs, but little pheromone messages that are secreted by these little um, minuscule uh, glands between the toes that secrete something called semiochemicals which are communications, they're a lot like pheromones. And your dog needs that stuff. And he or she earns that reinforcer by doing the right thing that is eliminating where the leader wants it done. So you take the puppy out in the morning, uh, he or she does a little job for you, and you immediately lead that puppy off territory. So you need to be dressed with your coat or whatever so that you can go off territory. And it does not work if you walk the puppy around the yard because those scents and those messages from other dogs don't exist in your yard or within your dog's territory. They're outside the territory. And even if you have a puppy, as long as those vaccinations are current, they should be given about every three weeks, two to four, but approximately every three weeks, until the puppy is about 14 to 16 weeks, then you can take that puppy off territory. Don't let anybody convince you that your puppy is at risk of getting infectious disease. Um, you, know, you don't want to take a puppy on a tour of, of animal control center or you know, places where lots of other sick dogs have been. Um, but it's just like a child going to school. If they're protected with vaccinations, it is a necessary part of their development. And sure, there are risks. But they're much, much smaller um, than the risk of not doing the right thing for the puppy's development. And learning house training the appropriate way is absolutely a big priority. So you get up in the morning and you take that puppy out there and she earns the great privilege by eliminating for you. So you head out. It doesn't have to be a long walk, three, four, five minutes, and you come back in. And when you come back in the house, you put the puppy in that pre-designated little room that we're going to use for this purpose for this one day. And in there, instead of a bowl of food, we're going to use a food toy. Now there's lots of different kinds of food dispensing toys. This is one of my favorites. Well, actually, it's the favorite of many dogs um, and cats, too. You can put dry food in this thing. It's called a Twist and Treat, made by a company called um, PetSafe. And uh, actually, the brand is Busy Buddy, B-U-S-Y-B-U-D-D-Y, -D -D Busy Buddy. And this particular one's a Twist and Treat. And what's handy about it is that you can put dry food in here. What I prefer is putting canned food, canned puppy food, for example, and be prepared by putting it in a Ziploc bag the night before and freezing it overnight. So that when you give this to the puppy, you can open it up a little bit more if you need to make it easier for the puppy to extract the food. But that puppy's going to be hungry, and the puppy needs to engage in another canine-specific behavior, which is foraging. Yeah, they're predators and they're hunters, but at that age especially, um, they need to extract their food and work at it. And their mother teaches them that by example um, because, frankly, they don't get lucky enough to catch a rabbit every day, so they find dead stuff. And that's programmed into our pet dog's brains uh, because, you know, they could return to the wild 
and in fact, sometimes they do. So you give him something to do for an hour that is innate to the dog. So it's got food to work on, hungry, so it's going to be motivated to extract that food, and you stay out of that room. That puppy is off limits to everybody in the family for a full hour. And then an hour later, you go in there and you put the leash on the puppy. Don't make a big fuss. Don't have this great joyous reunion. This is very matter-of-fact stuff. Um, puppy's going to follow your emotional example. And if you put a whole lot of emotion into this thing, you're simply going to uh, distract your puppy. And your puppy's learning a really valuable lesson, and it's repetitive. Because one hour after the first trip outside, you put the leash on the puppy, and you lead her back out to the yard to that same location where you want this stool and urine to occur. And if the puppy produces, once again, you can say, good baby, you can give her a little treat, but the reward, without emotion, without a lot of histrionics and, you know, cartwheels because you're so delighted, you leave that out. And you take that puppy out for another little jaunt down the street so that she can have earned that privilege and enjoy that social contact with all those scents and, and messages. Now, suppose you take the puppy outside and she doesn't do anything at all. You just give her a few minutes, if nothing happens, she just didn't need to go. Take her back into that little room, she's got the food toy, and you close the door, and you leave him in there. Uh, again, nobody visits, and an hour later, you repeat the process. And so every hour throughout this full day, that puppy goes out and has the opportunity to earn the privilege of a leash walk-off territory. Um, and when she doesn't do it, there's nothing happens, she's just come back inside. So you've done this all day long. And it doesn't matter who it is in the family who does this. You want this procedure to be carried out the same way by whoever does it. But it isn't about the person, and it isn't about bonding with the puppy. Um, it's about teaching the puppy a lesson and making it easy. And uh, Vicki, well, so, well, thank you for tuning in, Vicki. Good to see you, too. So anyway, that's one day. And the truth is that most puppies actually get it. Now, I like to set the puppy up for success a little bit longer and don't give a good dog an opportunity to go bad. You want them to have opportunities to understand what to do. So after you've done a full day of this and you've done it consistently and during the night you can put the puppy in a crate and by the way, an excellent thing to put in the or near the crate plugged into a wall outlet and I don't have one handy here, didn't think about it, but a plug-in Adaptil uh, pheromone diffuser, A-D-A-P-T-I-L. Adaptil is a synthetic analog of a naturally occurring pheromone that's produced by mother dogs. And in fact, uh, all female dogs have these glands that go from front to back between the mammary glands in the abdomen. But in a female dog who isn't just delivering a puppy, the glands are not active. But the hormone shifts that occur right around the time that the puppies are delivered, um, <laughs> I have cats jumping around here, um, those glands get activated by the hormone fluctuations so that when the puppies are born, they are exposed to this odorless pheromone that are secreted by these specialized glands, and it keeps them calm. It has a calming effect, so in the wild, they don't squawk and raise a lot of ruckus that would attract predators. So the development of these, of these uh, pheromone secreting glands is a survival adaptation in the dog. And again, it has no scent of the dog or anybody else. Well, the adaptal plug-in diffuser, looks a lot like a room freshener, is something that, um, we have a wild cat in here. So there's cat noises. It's okay. <laughs> Carolyn's trying to manage this guy. It's all right. So anyway, um, it's a synthetic analog, and there's very strong research behind it that um, it helps them stay calm and it helps them adjust to their new home, and it diminishes the length of time that they cry. They found in one study that puppies without this pheromone typically cried at night for the first two weeks in their new home, and with the adaptal diffuser in a relatively small room so that it can dissipate into the air, uh, they cry for about two days. And so it's not only a lot easier for us to live with a new puppy that way, but we're, of course, developing a low-stress environment for the puppy, which, well, again, let's make it easy for the puppy to adapt. 
It's not easy moving into a human home having just left mother and litter mains. So um, adaptable diffusers are a great thing. So at the end of these hourly opportunities for your puppy to earn those, the great reinforcer of a hike off property, then you, um, uh, you put the puppy in the crate for the night. And the next day, what I like to do is have a leash, just a typical leash, and connect it to your puppy's collar, just like this. Okay? Can you see that? There you go. There she is. And then get one of these little lightweight carabiners. You know, you see these things at the check stand at the pharmacy. You get them as little things like pens. This one came from a veterinary, uh, a veterinary company that makes uh, equipment and uh, medications. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You get these anywhere. And then you clip this little um, carabiner to the handle on the leash, okay? And then you clip the, uh, the carabiner to your belt, okay? So now you have your puppy tethered to your belt. And again, anybody in the family can do this. So wherever you go in the house, your puppy goes with you. Or if it's somebody else in the family, really doesn't matter. So if you're sitting down someplace, uh, answering your email, watching TV, reading, uh, cooking in the kitchen, whatever, your puppy goes with you. And you can have a nice pad next to you on the floor um, and a food dispensing toy. And so far, we haven't even put dog food or puppy food in a bowl. This puppy is kept occupied, engaged in a normal canine behavior, uh, focused on this instead of, you know, wringing her little paws like, oh my goodness, where's my family? They're focused on surviving, okay? That's normal. And again, what I like about this twist and treat is that if you, you know, put the food in it and you say, darn it all, it's, I made it a little too challenging, you simply unscrew it a little bit, make it easier for the puppy to, you know, get in there and dig out the food. You can get other kinds of food toys. The best one for your dog is the one your dog uses. Um, this isn't the best for everybody. It's just, I find it most useful in many cases. So you've got the puppy close tethered to you and every couple of hours, whoever it is in the family who has the puppy tethered to them can take the puppy outside to the yard to that place where you always want her to go. And if she goes, earn that wonderful reinforcer of a jaunt off territory to sniff and investigate. Puppy doesn't do anything, it's no problem. Just come back inside again. So we'll get to the question in a minute about what happens when there's an accident. Okay, we're getting there because these things aren't perfect. They're based on canine behavior that's innate, but that doesn't make them bulletproof. So I like to suggest that we close tether this puppy to somebody in the family every single day for about a week. Um, and when there's nobody at home, then the puppy should be in a small room. Uh, crating, yes, it's a great thing for a dog to learn to be relaxed in a crate, but they can go pretty stir crazy if they're in there longer than a couple of hours, unless it's during the night. That's a different thing because the sleep-wake cycle, everybody's supposed to sleep through the night, especially a puppy. But during the daytime, um, a smaller, like a guest bathroom is a good thing with food toys. Um, but you know, the problem with doing that and it's an eight hour work day and nobody's at home, um, is that puppy needs to go. And one of the most important parts of this whole thing is for the puppy not to make an unsupervised mistake. If your puppy urinates or defecates in the house during this process and it wasn't given an opportunity to do it in the right place outside and earn that reinforcer, we've sort of set the puppy up for failure. So. I prefer, yeah, you can leave the puppy in a crate. Um, puppy can be boarded at doggy daycare. Um, ideally, when you get a puppy, you've got uh, taken about a week off work, maybe even two, uh, at least somebody in the family who can manage this thing. Um, and during the close tether uh, training, every couple of hours, somebody's going outside with the puppy. And after about a week of that, you think, you know, this puppy doesn't look like she's made any mistakes. Maybe she's really trained. And that is when you unhook the leash from your belt. After your puppy's had something to eat, there's a natural urge not only to defecate about 15 minutes after eating, but to urinate too. And so we just drop the leash on the floor and you're wearing your sneakiest sneakers or your ballet slippers or your barefoot. And you let that puppy sneak off and you just like a little uh, ninja warrior, you sneak along behind, just silent as the night, and you 
Just see if you're going to bust that puppy in in the act of making a mistake. And corrections are a good thing. I'm not talking about harsh punishment by any means. I'm not talking about scaring the puppy because fear is not a legitimate learning strategy. Fear is not what we want, frankly, ever. I mean, we've all been afraid of something in our life. We've all been startled, uh, sometimes uh, at the hands of somebody who intends uh, to cause us fear. And it's not only unpleasant, but you don't come away learning. There's nothing about learning theory that indicates that fear is an appropriate teacher of anything, uh, except to maybe not trust whoever it was who, who meted out the fearful stimulus. So let's not damage a relationship we're trying to nurture and develop into man's and woman's best friend here. Fear, not for us. So if you let, drop that leash and the puppy sneaks off, and, oh, there she squats, step on the leash real quick so it doesn't get away from you, pick it up, and you can use a firm tone, and you can say, Miss America, no. You know, you can put a little firm inflection on the word no. That's about it. What you're really going to do is grab the leash and head outside to where you want to go, and if that puppy's dribbling all the way, that's part of the deal here, and you get out to where you want that puppy to eliminate, and even if she's done dribbling, give her a minute there, and then reinforce her with a little walk-off territory. And what you've learned is the puppy wasn't quite as ready as we thought. Cases like that, I like to go back and do one more full day of one-day house training, and then do another week of close tether training. Now this whole thing becomes a bit more complicated in an adult dog who has a long-standing habit of house soiling. And somebody, oh, Joanna, hey, thank you for, Joanna, I should say, I've called you Joanna before. Joanna, I apologize. Thank you for tuning in. It's always great to have you. Um, but if you've got an adult dog who's got a long-standing habit of doing the wrong thing, what I always tell people is at least three, if not four consecutive days of the one-day method, hour after hour, four days in a row would be ideal. We're just repetitively drumming this into the dog's head that if you don't do anything when you go out to the special dumping ground in the yard, no problem. You get an opportunity an hour later to try it again. And when you do go, you earn that wonderful trip off territory. And a little snack is a good thing too um, because food is a wonderful reinforcer. And by the way, Petting for most dogs is actually even more potent than food. <laughs> Petting preys and a little treat, but immediately that hike off territory. Um, so in an adult dog with a long history whose veterinarian has checked it out uh, with blood and urine tests, no urinary infection, uh, no bladder stones. Sometimes an x-ray is necessary to rule out bladder stones completely. Um, no diabetes, no kidney failure, no liver disease. A healthy dog, just confused. So three or four, four ideally consecutive days of one day house training, and then at least a couple of weeks of consistent close tether training. Dog goes wherever the person goes, tethered to your belt, so that there is no way to make an unsupervised mistake until you say, eh, maybe this dog has it. And that's when you drop the leash after a meal and you sneak off to see what's going to happen. Um, because repeating indoor mistakes only repeats the habit. So. What happens when you've got the problem here? Let me tell you a story about Molly. It was a West Highland White Terrier. Molly was 10 weeks old, and uh, I, uh, they went to my website. All this stuff is on my website, by the way, drjeffnichol.com, D-R-Jeff-N-I-C-H-O-L. And my border collie's sort of upside down sitting in my lap here. Um, and they had uh, little Molly, the West Highland White, 10 weeks old. And um, so they took her outside and, and tried the one-day house training method. Um, but she seemed like a, a slow learner. And uh, so they contacted me and they said, look, we, we did exactly what you instructed and uh, she's not catching on. What's the problem? So I had them bring Molly in. Uh, we can have urinary infections in puppies that age. We can have congenital kidney disorders that can cause them to drink and urinate excessive volumes that you wouldn't expect puppies to have developed that problem. Well, sometimes they're born with it. Uh, some puppies have what's called a patent urachus, which is a defect in the bladder where there's a direct line of exit of urine from the bladder itself through the skin under, of the abdomen without going through the genitals. Those puppies leak all the time. That's a surgical correction for a birth defect. 
Some babies have what's called a uh, ectopic ureters. Um, that's the tube that leads urine from the kidney to the bladder, but on one side and occasionally both, it goes directly into the genital area and not to the bladder. Those puppies are dribblers. They, you don't train or teach anything about that. It's a urinary problem. And so we always, if we've got a slow learner, we say, all right, let's make sure urinalysis, a good thorough exam, a very careful history, and that's largely my job. Um, when does it occur? Where does it occur? Does the puppy seem aware of it? All of that stuff is very important. Uh, some puppies have diarrhea, for example. It can be dietary. It can be intestinal parasites. We check a stool sample. We don't get to the behavioral solutions of these things until we're mighty sure that everything else in the body has been ruled out so that it's the brain we're working with, okay? So then uh, little Molly came in and we had ruled out everything else. And so that's when I started to drill down on the behavioral history. In this case, exactly how do they do the one-day house training? Well, it turns out that they live kind of off in the uh, rural area and they have an enormous piece of property. It's like five or 10 acres. Um, and their house is way off the road. So what they were doing was that they were doing exactly what I taught them with one day house training, but when they gave Molly opportunities to go out to the dumping ground in their yard, they walked her out there, but it's a long hike out to the road. And so what they were doing was walking her around their, their property. Not good enough, sorry about that, but the problem is that there is no scent of other dogs in your yard, I don't care how big it is, unless you know you have no fence and there are other creatures walking through your property right past your house. Because what's so valuable and essential about this uh, opportunity that a dog earns from its leader by eliminating in the right place, whether it's a feral dog or whether it's a domestic pet like yours or mine, is that after they eliminate, they have to be able to get that privilege of sniffing and investigating where the other dogs have been. So what these folks had to do, and it was an extra step, and they didn't want to take it because it was a hassle, understandably, but when Molly eliminated in their yard where they wanted her to learn to go, I said, have the car ready, put her in the car, drive down the driveway, jump out on the road, and walk up and down the road, and then come back. <clears throat> and then she was getting those needs met, that essential reinforcer, and then she caught on. So you've got to do it the way a dog needs to have it done. This thing can be frustrating. <clears throat> you know, it doesn't always go as planned. And in some cases, people, uh, they say, look, I've had it. I've done exactly what's necessary. I am so tired of this urine and this stool on my house. And I think this dog is, just needs a little firmer management. I, I, I think that she's intentionally trying to spite me. And uh, he's just, just trying to see what he can get away with. And please don't go down that path because dogs don't do that. Dogs... You know, many people want their dog to follow instructions, uh, follow commands, learn house training, uh, because they believe that the dog's job is to please them. Well, there's nothing wrong with that concept, except that that's not what's going on in their canine brain. What dogs love us, there's no question that it, that it is love just like you and I understand it. But their motivation is to earn privileges. Because the way they're wired is that the only thing that they have an entitlement to is air to breathe and water to drink. Everything else in their life, whether it's food, an opportunity to sniff and investigate off territory, um, affection from us, any interaction with us at all, going out of the house, coming in the house, going for a walk, going for a ride, uh, playing ball, anything the dog likes, it must be earned. And if you require your dog to earn everything, and we call it earned privileges, then that dog has a canine-specific relationship with its leader. And the dog watches for opportunities to earn those things, including a pat on the head or a kind word. And you think, my goodness, I don't want my dog to be, you know, like a low-end citizen who has to earn everything. If you treat your dog like a dog, you're much less prone to end up in my exam room with an anxiety-related behavior that could have been avoided because your dog has a dog specific life and you're not trying to teach them to speak human you are adopting canine leadership and how you manage your dog so if your dog has to earn everything you can have great fun teaching your dog to sit or down or jump through a hula hoop or google silly dog trick 
uh, tricks on the internet and teach your dog all kinds of fun stuff to do, and your dog is watching you for opportunities to earn privileges, that's what a healthy subordinate in a canine social group is doing most of the time. That and surviving, which, you know, goes back to the food dispensing puzzle toys. Um, so, uh, you, you know, don't, if your dog doesn't get it, it's not about the dog, it's about the structure. Don't, you don't go on a guilt trip, please, and don't punish your dog. Old-fashioned ideas like rubbing their nose in the stool of the urine and hitting them on the rear end with a newspaper. What you're doing is teaching fear and you're damaging a relationship and there's no need for that. What you need to do instead is say, okay, what went wrong with the system? What's missing? Just like Molly's folks, they came in and they said, all right, look, we've done it, but we don't understand why it didn't work. Well, they had a misunderstanding about one component. Yeah, we figured that out and everything went fine. Um, and, you know, sometimes a general practicing veterinarian has evaluated a dog or a, or a puppy for physical issues, and you know, there was one thing that was so rare and unusual the doctor didn't find it. Sometimes a specialist, like an internist, needs to look for that stuff. Maintain that relationship. Love your puppy and build trust. And an easy way for everybody is a canine-specific system. So that's what this is all about. Actually, you know what it's about is kindness. It's about recognizing that a dog is not a little person in a furry suit. Um, I love my pets as though that's exactly what they were, but I know that this is a dog and these other two guys are cats and they're members of a different species. And if I recognize that their needs are different than another person, then I can have empathy for the differences and I can employ methods that work with how they function and I can bring out their best. Um, so, you know, back to the house training thing. This is a structure that does not allow unsupervised mistakes indoors because let's reinforce and repeat the behaviors that we want. And kindness is about, okay, if the system didn't work, let's talk to an expert, you know, veterinary behavior specialist like myself, or a good trainer who's credentialed in that kind of stuff would recognize, all right, this is what we're missing. Let's make an adjustment. Let's change something. Uh, or let's have a good general practicing veterinarian make sure that there aren't any other physical issues and rule that stuff out. So we're going to set them up for success. Um, so thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, I plan to be back next week and I'll give everybody a heads up about what we're going to be talking about. And I hope everybody had a wonderful holiday. And if there are questions about new puppies or kittens, by all means, contact me on Facebook. And I'm delighted to address those questions. So Miss America... Say goodbye to our friends. And there are two cats are messing around other parts of my office here, just throwing things into a state of disarray because that's what cats do. <laughs> Have a great evening, everybody.